I can tell you how nice it is to say once again, it's time once again for the Real People Multi Game Solitaire Mega Tournament. It's it's somewhat nice. I had a great summer. Um, compliments of Pablo. Pablo uh, is still the game's not over yet. Um, but he he's facilitating a. Uh, Origins How He Became Human game, which I've been really enjoying. There's a series of videos attached to that, which will feed into the Real People Multi-Game Solitaire Mega Tournament. But that's not why we're here today. We're here today because I have some table space and some time and the inclination to continue with the Zytol leg right back here. Can you see that? Yes, you can. Um, so we've already done the Kronos game, and that was to decide on the starting money in this combinatory game of Chrononauts and U.S. Patent number one. Now I'm going to have to explain to you the rules on that. It's a little bit more, the melding of the, the two games is a little bit more complicated than the melding of the other games I've had. Um, this could, this should be the culmination of the Zytol leg. Like, this should decide who gets to be the Zytol in both Throne World and Time Agent. However, it is foreseeable that this game is called due to time length. I haven't developed um, this kind of new game that er that has arisen from the combination of the two games. Both Chrononauts and um, especially U.S. Pat Number One can both be games that can just continue. I've I've actually removed some of the checks from Chrononauts that made it so that the game would um, end in a somewhat timely fashion. So it could just go on and on, in which case it's conceivable that I might call it and have some other game decide it. Because, um, you know, I, ha I, I I'm not fully developing and playtesting these combinatory games. I just, there's just not an incentive uh, for me to do that. All right, so here we have the, the dummy game I was, I was playing without even real people cards. I was just doing it to, to play with mechanisms and see what's going on. Um, all set up. As you can see, it's not um, a standard grid like uh, Chrononauts. That was a late decision I made in um, combining them. I thought it was more interesting to do it this way to kind of cluster them in these sort of time groups. And then um, I, I feel like the combination game could be pretty um, customizable in that respect. You can you can make different sorts of grids with different, you know, there's lots of different Chrononauts expansions you can throw in or take out. Um, I think originally I filtered out, this is pr pr primarily early American Chrononauts mixed with the regular Chrononauts with maybe like the gore years mixed in. And then I took out some cards, I forget even why I did it, that was that was probably half a year ago that I, I, I worked on this on and off, not really worked, kind of dabbled with this on and off for about half a year, probably was maybe about five hours of work total. <laughs> but that's just how spottily I do things. Anyway, so here we have um, these figures. For those of you who don't know US Pat number one, you're going around on a board like this. And it's a roll and move game. I, I try to keep as much aspects from either game as I could, so I kept the roll and move aspect. You're going around on a board like that's made up of these squares. Um, instead I, I cut I cut out that board and the, the time agents are actually moving ar around on the cards. They're going through time that way. They can either move laterally, which doesn't cost any money, or they can move um, horizontally, I guess. And so this would wrap around over here like so, or they can move vertically by paying a, a, a buck for every um, every space in either direction they can go. So they can kind of cut across time by spending more money. Um, I used money, I think, a lot more than either game. Um, this is the Chrononauts deck I'm using. It's entirely just the patch cards. I got rid of the items, which is one of the ways that you can make the game shorter. I think the whole reason the items are in there is in part to be wacky, but in part to make the game shorter. I got rid of them all together because they just kind of detracted from the whole time travel thing. So the goal of the game is the goal of Chrononauts and US Patent number one. Every player is going to have their, you know, their public, their public image like in US Patent number one here. Um, and in US Patent number one what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to upgrade your time machine, so have a full working time machine and then make it back to the patent office in 1790 when it first opens to get the very first patent and that's the way you kind of cinch in time travel. I don't know if you can see the patent office here, it's represented by this little circle. Um, I'll show you that up close when I'm holding the camera. Okay, but then in Chrononauts you also have a secret identity which is like this and that says how you have to have the timeline. I'm not going to explain Chrononauts fully because there are, there are other videos out there for that. Um, so basically in this game you got to make the timeline um, 
the, the, it, you got to make the timeline your timeline, then go back and get the patent on time travel at the patent office and cut it off. So you kind of have to meet both goals of the game. It's another reason why I think this might take a while. So the flow of play goes is first um, the the person who's furthest in the future, so in this case the blue player, is going to draw a number of cards equal to the number of the players. I'm playing with five players currently, um, and these are the patch cards. They use these to patch um, different timelines. Now they can pick any any patch card that is either in their current year or further back. So um, the person in the future, they not only get to choose first, but they also get to um, get the widest selection. And generally I've found that in a five player game anyway, generally the only the first three players who get a shot at it get a chance. The reason why is if you don't have a, a patch card that fits your secret identity, it's kind of to your advantage to choose one that's far back in time because that keeps it away, keeps it out of someone else's hand. Patch cards are nice if you successfully patch a timeline. You By fixing the paradox, you get another turn. Um, that's how I'm playing it. Okay, so that's how it starts, and everyone uh, takes turns just like in um, U.S. Patent Number One. They can do an action, and they can roll a die and move. They can move twice, and I, I don't remember the U.S. Patent rules, but I said that you can do an action before you roll the die if you want. The reason why you might want to do that is one of the actions you can do is you can um, go antiquing, and this is an idea that um, I'm sure there's probably a game that's just all about this. But when I was a child. My father had um, this wallpaper in his house that had uh, in in one of his bathrooms that I used a lot. I would go poop in, and the wallpaper had a lot of um, prices of old timey things on it. It was like it was like supposed to be newspaper advertisements, and I would think about like what would what would happen if you went back in time and bought those things because they were very cheap, and then sold them in the future. How you could. Um, make money doing that. So that's the main way you can make money in this game. You can, like in US Patent number one, just get a dollar just as your action for the turn. But the more effective way to make money is to put down your marker here. So here we see the white player. He has a marker there. Um, the further he goes in f the future away from that before he cashes out the marker. So this marker um, denotes that he got some item from there and he's going to go into the future to sell it. The further in the future you go to sell it, the um, more money you get. So I think the rate is twenty dollars per, or no, one one dollar per twenty years, or one dollar per um, level this way, whichever is more. And so that's the main way to make money, and that's kind of the main, uh, I guess, along with the card drafting, one of the main new mechanisms. Another thing you can do that's new is um, if you you can just ripple just by being on a, a, a space. I think you can also ripple the linchpins, turn the linchpins like from Chrononauts. Again, I'm not going to explain Chrononauts. You'll have to figure that out somewhere else. Um, and it's a fairly common game, so you pro you maybe played it. If you ripple a linchpin um, and say it rip ripples a year someone else is at, that's like it bonks them and gets them out of there. Um, so they lose their cards, or they get their cards replaced because it's a paradox. It just messes everything up, and then they have to go back to start essentially. Um, but they do lose their their different items. There are different items there. Items work like in use pat number one. At the start of a turn, someone gets an idea, and that idea goes to the year. Let's see. So this is 1953. So this idea would go to. Um, 1957. 50, I, I made a rule you can only have one card per year though, so 57 is full. It has this shield there, and so you'd have to go to the next one. You could either put it face down, in which case someone could come and just take it. They don't know what it is though, or you could put it face up. And then if someone wanted to get it, they would have to buy it and it would cost them, in this case, nine bucks, which is pretty expensive. So usually that promotes putting the higher cost items face up and the lower cost ones face down, but not always, you know, as especially not now because our players are going to be starting with a lot more money than you would normally start in this game uh, because they get all their money from Kronos. Um, though I guess I haven't worked out, there might be a divisor on that. Um, so what else is new? Um, oh, if you're rippling, there's a way that people can stop you. Uh, I think to, to stop you, someone in the future has to initiate it and then someone in the past has to stop it and they each have to pay a buck in order to stop you. Um, the idea being that the person in the future notices that the future is being changed and then the per person in the past can do things to like change time so that you're not able to do it. So, you know, it's still fairly abstract, maybe not a perfect 
time simulation at all, but I tried to work in some things like that where you can do that. You can also, um, so I did the card drafting in order to get these patch cards into players' hands because you're not going to be drawing cards every turn. Um, and even if you did, that would take forever uh, to get what you need. Um, you can also, on your turn, you can hypothesize, which lets you just draw five cards and take one. It's the same kind of rule as before, though. You can't and this, this, you know, if you're actually playing with other humans, you'd have to go by trust. You can't take one that, that is further in time than you are. Um, just cause, just cause, or maybe you can. Maybe I'll change it so you can. I don't know. Um, so kind of, a, I'm kind of trying to get this this flow through time here. You go in the future because you can. Um, you have a better chance of getting these patch patch cards, you're, you're more likely to know how things are going to turn out. You go into the past to, to change time, because you can always change the future from the past. It costs more, more money um, based on how far you are from the linchpin that you want to change. It's, it's, I think, free to do it on the space. But say this white player, he, if he wanted to change the Pearl Harbor bombing by the Japanese, he could do it even from there. It would just cost him more. Um, so the, the past you had to have more, more power to change time, and the future you have more power on how you can change time. It's more of a knowledge place, and the past is more of the place for doing. So I think there's enough um, incentive for people to be moving back and forth. And then finally, at the end of a turn, um, two, two dice are going to be rolled, and the time, this is the time mechanic. He, um, he fixes your your different upgrades if they get um, disabled. The time, the time mechanic will move close, he'll move towards where, the, uh, towards the direction of time that has the, the greatest concentration of players. So at the start of the game he's going to be moving forward in time, but say he was right here in 1941, he would be moving backward in time because there are three players further back in time than him. Final big change is the junkyard. One of the big reasons for the junk oh, it's the junkyard slash future. One of the big reasons for the junkyard slash future is the the chrononauts, at least that I have, the cards I have, end in 2008 with the election of Barack Obama as president of the United States of America. Um, U.S. patent number one, it goes into 2100 something, I think, is as far, 2168, there you can see it there. Uh, and again, I'm not using these in the game. Uh, so, what do you do with those inventions? Because they're definitely part of the game. You don't want to take cards out of a design because that can mess it up, I think. Um, well, they just go here. In order to get something out of the far future, you have to pay a flat five, five bucks after you're in 2008. Um, and then if that card is a far future card, you have to pay the cost of it, no matter what. So it can be more expensive, but you get to look through this whole stack which you don't otherwise get to do. If it's a card from the... so this you'd have to pay five to even look in there and then ten more. So it's expensive to get things from the future, but that's inflation. Um, it also functions as the junkyard from US patent number one, so if you get some... so something gets trash, like say it's... say a card's on the Cuban Missile Crisis and the crisis gets paradoxed, this would get junked, and so it would go down the stream of time to the future and end up in a museum somewhere or in a junkyard somewhere. You can pay five gold to look, look through this stack and and then you can just take this however it's disabled, and that's where you need the, the time traveling mechanic to get it de disabled. Okay, here they are with their money. For those of you who don't remember, none, she had the most at the end of the um, last game, Kronos. I decided to make 20 the maximum bonus money they get. Um, it, 10 is about the average in US patent number one, and I don't want to go too far afield from that, uh, but I want it to be a substantial bonus, so 20 seems pretty good. So 2.5 was the divisor that ended up getting her 50, um, whatever the Kronos money is, uh, down to 20. So I just I just fed that through everyone else's and rounded down. So Oblio, he has 18. DJ Double J, she has 13. Desi has 12. And TD has 8. Now, um, so now let's go ahead and mix them up. Next up, we're going to decide on their public identities, so their, their starting time machine. Which basically, this decides their starting um, starting time and then an, and another um, bit of money that they're going to get on top of that. Uh, while I mix it up, I, I wanted to let you know that um, DJ Double J has actually been busy in between Kronos and now. She was uh, part of the crew of the Publucklin Wren for a short time. She was an engineer, a replacement engineer. She decided not to, to um, continue with that group, though. She had a good time, but 
she wanted to be able to finish this leg of the tournament, and if she was going to continue with the crew of the Pope Buckland Wren, she would no longer be um, she no longer be allowed to be in this leg because that's a whole other leg of the tournament. That's the Pope leg, and you know it seems like it's a it's a much uh, more crowded field there than just this five. She has a better chance of moving on to the semifinals this way. But since we're talking about her, let's see who she's going to be. She's going to be Mean Mr. Crumple which I think fits her. So she's uh, she's going to start in the past. He might be the furthest in the past. And she starts with a, good, a healthy bonus of 12. Let's move to the left from her to Oblio. Oblio is, oh, this is also a good person. Very fitting. Dr. Fudge McDonald. He's like the 70s kind of, I don't know. I was thinking of sort of a glam rock kind of um, character. That's more of a... Prog rock character. Maybe. All right, we're gonna do Desi now. We'll move concentrically out from the the center. Desi is Eleanor Case White. I think he doesn't appreciate this. Um, she starts in 1837, and her her time machine is called White's Improved Quantum Flux Injector Coil. One of the fun touches of this game is sort of the um, turn of the century feel, very much like the wallpaper in my father's old bathroom. Let's go now to Nun. None is Pansy Decker Holland. Her device is Pansy Decker's soil sampler and time traveling gizmo. She starts in 2020, so she's going to start in the future. I didn't even consider that a space. This is I, in all my plays. I never got a my tests. Actually, I didn't. I only did like two tests. Then uh, I never finished any of them. Um, but I never had anyone start in the future, so that'll be somewhat different. All right, TD. TD is going to be, oh, this is a good one for him, Alexander Shen, Shen's original temporal fluctuation exploiter. And he's also in the future, 2168. And he starts with 11 gold. That's pretty good. So um, I haven't decided if I'm going to let you see their secret identities or not, but I haven't drawn them yet. So what I did was I had the um, the two people who are most in the, who were in the future, that is beyond 2008, just beyond the, the future most spot, TD here because his character was 2,168 and then none here uh, with this fellow in the mask. She's in 2003. Now I know she looks more futuristic than TD's character. But that's only because she chose to play blue. Um, I tried to go with the colors that they had in Kronos rather than um, the the colors that the, the figures that would work for their spots. I think this might be a whistle. <whistles> yep. Um, that's the first time I noticed that. So here we have that. That's that's Oblio there. Now I think if you notice, um, the the times from U.S. Patent Number One don't always match up with the cards that we have from Chronos, uh, Chrononauts. Sorry. Um, you know, obviously that doesn't match up. But here, you know, this is 1980. He's supposed to start in 1977. What I do when they're supposed when a when a thing has a a certain time is I go to the next next card to the future from that time. That seems to work fine, and then I don't have to get hung up on that discrepancy. Uh, I think of it like sure they they started off in that time, but that time was just not meaningful enough to be represented in the game, so they just go to the next future time because they obviously can't go to the next past time because they hadn't started yet. They hadn't uh, they didn't have their lab yet. Okay, I went through the drafting, and just like I, I seem to be finding, only the first three people were able to get cards. Um, we have a very future-skewed game. The games I've played in the past, or started to play in the past, are past-skewed. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier that I never finished a game of this. Part of that was because, you know, I, I kept revamping the rules as I was going, but mainly this isn't a super fun solitaire game, multi multiplayer solitaire game, for me to play anyway. Um, I think it'd be more interesting with with other people because there's you know there's hidden identities and part of it is figuring out and then there's also the negotiation aspect of past and future people trying to negotiate on um, whether or not to stop a ripple that sort of thing going on so but still it'll be nice to see it and I think you know uh, with the the added social element of the real people cards and the videotaping might make it even more more fun for me so um, we're going in an in-depth turn here. DJ Double J, she gets to go first, despite not getting a card. So first thing she's going to do is she's going to draw one of these cards, a la U.S. Patent Number One, and this is called Research. 
Okay, so here she has a 1920 horseless carriage card. That's a, not a bad card. It's got four power, costs four power. Uh, everyone's time machine costs, has five power until they get some sort of power plant. So this is something someone, anyone could use and they get to add two to their movement roll while they have it in gear. So 1920 would look at the thing. That would be stock market crashes up there. I think she's going to go ahead and put that face down up there. She's got a shot at getting to it. Um, so does someone else. And then she's going to, I believe, go ahead and put down one of these markers. Remember, this is her antiquey marker. The other marker is just to, so I remember what color everyone is. Um, because sometimes, you know, I leave the game for a while and come back, and then it's helpful to remember. It also can be used on a, uh, as a marker on the patent counter here. So that's her marker there. That's where she's picked up some item. I'll let you imagine what it is. It's during 1814, the British burns Washington, D.C. So maybe it's a chunk of a chunk of the White House, um, a chunk, a charred chunk of the, the White House. Um, then she's got a roll a die because this is a roll and move game. She's got a five and she's going to go forward in time. One, two, three. Now here she could decide to go uh, vertically here and pay it, pay a buck, but there'd be no reason to because she can also just go this way and wrap off, wrap ahead in time. Four. Um, now she has to decide whether she wants to go this way or she wants to jump this way. And I think she's going to jump this way. Five. Now that's going to cost her a buck because she went vertically and then that's going to be her turn. Before I go on, I wanted to touch briefly on um, character identification in this game. So normally, um, in US patent number one or chrononauts you're going to have one identification uh, one person who you are in chrononauts you're going to have a secret ID and in US patent number one you're going to have um, a public identification and I talked a little bit about the public identifications I'm keeping the hidden IDs secret for now um, it's tough in a solitaire game to know whether or not to keep them face up or face down uh, Face-up's more useful in making decisions because otherwise I have to do a lot of turning the cards over and turning down, especially during that drafting phase. But keeping them face down kind of um, highlights to me that I that the other players don't know it, so I don't know what I'm going to do. But anyway, I'm not going to be speaking about the characters in terms of either of those IDs because in this particular game they have a third identification, which is their real people card, and that's the one that I'm going to focus on because that is what's important to us, right? Right. All right. Desi's first turn of the game. Uh, he got extremely lucky. He's not even going to roll the die. He's just going to go here and pick this up, uh, which is the card he put there. It's uh, Cobb's Electric Label Maker. This is going to give him five power. Um, the 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 uh, the chassis, the weapon, and the um, shield that you add to your time machine. You want to be really conscious of this number. Power, you just want as high a number as you can get because that's what it adds. The other ones, that's what it takes away. Now, generally, the the, the items that are um, more expensive do more for you, but um, if you don't have the power to power them, they they don't do anything. So anyway, getting a getting a power uh, I upgrade right off is a pretty decent thing. He might try to change out later on but it's definitely a good way to start the game with that Cobb's electric label maker. Oblio's turn. He went over here. He rolled a big six. Big roll for Oblio. He went back here and he's snatching up this card here. Now this is this is one of the things that's tough to play solitaire uh, when there's a card face down. I really had to uh, try and forget one what it is and then two ask myself what Oblio would do in this situation I think he would be tempted by the card and so he's taking it and it is a How's horseless carriage so he can have more big moves in the future That's going to add plus two to his movement while he has that house horseless carriage An even more auspicious first move for none she uh, drew this card and placed it here in a hurry. And remember what we've been saying about power cards. Uh, this is a power plan. It's called a Slinker's De Deuterium, Deuterium, sorry, Forge. And that's going to give her nine power, which is huge. That's going to make her a target, I think, as well, because um, you know she can now take a twelve item and 
two more one items and then she has her time machine put together and something fairly strong uh, because 9 plus 5 is 14 12 plus 1 plus 1 is 14 it, you know but then you gotta find those items too you kinda in this game you kinda have to take what you can get but still that's a good first find 9 power for Selinker's Deuterium Forge well, TD finished things off because he's at the end of the turn order, not because he's special in any way, just because he's at the end. Um, and he play he plays the card face up, the personal analog assistant. He liked the idea that um, people could use that to protect themselves, uh, and decided that they should know that there is there is help if they need it. Back in 1898, um, then he moved backwards in time and did some hypothesizing, which allowed him to draw some Chrononauts cards, uh, some patch cards, which he got to choose one. Now it's time to move the time mechanic. Let's see how far he can move. This is the first time this game we're going to get to move him. Ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I haven't decided if I want him to stop on people or not. I don't think he's going to. Nine, ten. There he is. He's at the Rebels Retreat. Time mechanic. At the start of turn two, once again, only the first three people have gotten cards. These two here, Desi and DJ Double J, have yet to get any Chrononauts cards. Again, that's because um, if the card is further ahead in time than them, then they are not allowed to get it. It's currently Oblio's turn. He has a tough choice to make. So we've already established that Oblio likes to take cards that are face down. Um, Desi just put a card face down right there. Desi doesn't have a choice about that. He could have put it face up, I guess, but he had to put it there. Anyway, Oblio is tempted to take it. However, Oblio just put a card right back here that looks that he knows is very tasty. Uh, but can he make it in time? He thinks he might be able to with Howe's horseless carriage. So I think he's going to give a shot, but we've got to see what kind of roll he gets. A six. That's perfect. That gives him eight. So he can go one, two, or let's see. He goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. He can get back to there, which is pretty close. So he'll do that, and he'll try to get it on his next turn. Hopefully no one else gets there first, but I don't think they'd be able to. An annoyance of roll and move right there. One is all TD got. He needed a two or better to do what he wanted to do. He can't do what he wants to do, so he has to go and look at the Oklahoma City bombing, which can't be anything but depressing for him. I'm sure he doesn't enjoy seeing that kind of carnage. Um, I guess there are other things to do in 95. There, it wasn't a bad year. Um, so, yeah, maybe, maybe he has some good memories. Actually, that's the future for TD. That's five years in the future. Uh, maybe he can let people know in 1990 about the bombing that is to come. And you know what time it is, don't you? It's time to move the time mechanic. Here we go. Four. Here he goes. One, two, three, four. Oh. Uh. 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 Hey. That's where I'm going to have to leave it right now. My son could wake up at any moment. I'd rather leave at the end of the turn than in the middle of a turn. It's easier for me to remember. So far I'm enjoying the game. I'm um, I'm seeing this kind of s this movement of back and forth in time. Uh, I feel like there's enough incentive for people to travel and I think that uh, you know if you're in the future or in the past there is there seems to be an advantage to either. Um, so it's good so far. We'll see how the rest of it goes.